Welcome to the Essential Southern Podcast, where we explore the rich history, culture, and traditions of the American South. Welcome to the Essential Southern Podcast, where we seek to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. This podcast is sponsored by the Abbeville Institute. Go to abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. You can support our work there. You can make a donation. We do exist on your generous contributions alone. So please consider a tax-deductible donation to the Folk Send Law. Again, go to abbevilleinstitute.org to support our work. Well, what is a Southerner? This is a big question. And what is a Southern tradition? When we say we're going to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, what does that actually mean? Well, we're going to go back and look at an at a essay written about 30 years ago now that actually addressed this question. What, it, what is a Southerner? What does it mean to be Southern? Now, we have all of these things thrown around today, this idea of the South, a Southerner. And, of course, that term has now been used as a pejorative. If you're a Southerner, if you're pro-Southern, if you're pro-South, well, then you are somehow a white supremacist, a racist, an anti-Semitic person, a neo-Nazi. But, of course, all of these things aren't true. They're anti-intellectual statements meant to disarm the other side and not really have a full conversation about the meaning of Southern, the identity of Southern. Is Southern white supremacists? No. Were there white supremacists in the South? Of course there were. Are there white supremacists in the South? Of course, just as there are in the North. That's an ideology that's not tied to the tradition. What about anti-Semitic? Were there anti-Semitic Southerners? Of course. Are there currently anti-Semitic Southerners? Of course, just as there are in the North. But again, that's an ideology that's not tied to the tradition. Same thing with neo-Nazism, which of course is simply an ideology. The Southern tradition is not an ideology. It's a tradition based on culture, customs, music, art, literature, uh, these type of things. It is not an ideology. It's based on traditional experiences. And you can be Southern no matter where you are. You can be Southern if you're in the West, if you're in the South, if you're in the North. It's a particular way of looking at tradition. And of course, there are a lot of Southerners who have spread out across the United States that still consider themselves to be Southern. You look at Bakersfield, California, for example, or many other places that were settled by Southerners throughout the 19th century. And there are still people in these areas that are very much Southern today, regardless of whether they're living below the Mason-Dixon line, just as there are a lot of people living in the South that aren't necessarily Southern. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to go back to an essay that was written in the 1990s by Clyde Wilson. The title is, What is a Southerner? And I want to go through this essay because I think Professor Wilson makes some pretty profound statements about the South, and he goes back to the, to the core of it all, which, of course, is culture. Culture matters. Everything flows downstream from culture. Now, of course, he is going to say that this culture developed below the Mason-Dixon line. We would call it politically Jeffersonian or Jeffersonian Republican in terms of politics, but then there are, of course, other parts of this as well that Professor Wilson is going to address in this particular essay. So let's get into it. The title, again, is What is a Southerner? This was published at the Abbeville Institute in 2014, yet... Professor Wilson uh, wrote this essay in the 1990s. It was published elsewhere before that. Uh, the Institute just published it uh, almost a decade ago now, in April of 2014. He says, Scholars in every field in the humanities and social sciences have long recognized that Southerners have, a, have formed a distinct people within the body of Americans from the earliest colonial times of the present. So Southerners are a distinct people. Culturally, this is what you have to have to be a distinct people. If you're talking about Southern identity, there is a culture to it. Authorities in history, political science, economics, sociology, folklore, literature, geography, speech, and music have recognized and studied the significance of this distinctiveness. The distinct identity of Southerners has also, of course, been a commonplace of everyday life in the United States, Distinctive Southern manners, customs, attitudes, and behavior have been material for our greatest creative artists in song, story, and movie making. Nearly every college in the United States and many in Europe, as well as Japan and Australia, offer courses in Southern history, literature, and other subjects. A number of universities have special institutes 
devoted to the study of the South. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the University of South Carolina, the University of Mississippi, Johns Hopkins University, and Cambridge University are a few examples. Thousands of scholars around the world are studying Southernness. Thousands of books and dozens of popular and academic journals and websites are available today that are devoted specifically and exclusively to the South. It cannot be credited that this activity would be devoted to something unless it was real and significant. So you can't have a study of these things unless something about this is real and significant. So this is, he's going to address the question, what is a Southerner? Many explanations and descriptions have been offered in scholarly literature as to the origins and nature of a distinctive Southern people, beginning with the ethnic origins of the American colonial population and coming up to recent date in studies of public opinion and voting behavior. An important recent and authoritative study is Albion Seed, Four British Folkways in America by David Hackett Fisher, prize-winning professor of history at Brandeis University, Boston. From exhaustive study in Britain and America, Fisher has identified four different cultural groups on the British Isles that formed differentiated cores of cultural development in what has become the United States. These groups come from different regions of Britain and were separated by religious denomination, economic activity, dialect, manners, and customs. So again, there is a distinctive Southern people based on culture. Based on culture. Not about race. Not about ideology, but about culture. Puritan settlers of New England who came from the East Anglia region of England and formed an identifiable religious and cultural group which spread to other parts of the northern states. That's one group. Settlers from the English Midlands and Wales who settled in the Delaware Valley region belonged to a variety of dissenting religious, uh, religious groups such as Quakers and Baptists and pursued economic activities and goals different from those of New England and the South. Gentry and servants from the English southern counties who settled Virginia and the Carolinas in the 17th century, largely Anglican, engaged in plantation agriculture and displaying manners, customs, and attitudes very distinct from groups 1 and 2. And finally, borderers, sometimes loosely described as Celtic, who came from Ireland, Scotland, and the Scots-English border region. They were largely Presbyterian, and their ways of living and making a living were markedly different from those of the ordinary English. They settled in the Piedmont regions of the southern colonies and spread across the Appalachians in the late 18th century. So these are the four groups that Fisher came up with. Four identifiable cultural distinctive groups or distinctively cultural groups in the British North American colonies. Fisher piles up convincing data that these groups form different cultural centers in the evolution of America. Groups three and four merged in the early 19th century to become the southern people. The distinctiveness of a Southern people was well recognized by everyone at that time, by Southerners, by Northerners, and by foreign travelers. The famous English writer Charles Dickens observed after a trip to America that the Americans formed two distinct peoples. Fisher also provides ex extensive and convincing evidence that these distinct American cultures persist to this day, a distinctiveness which can be seen in attitudes, political behavior, and daily life. An interesting example he provides is the startling different actions and methods of leadership of two American generals in the Pacific Theater during World War II, both named Smith, one from the North and one a Southerner. Countless other examples can be cited showing differences in recent history. So this is not just something in the antebellum period or in colonial history, but all the way up to the present. Professor Wilson is making a case for a distinctive Southern people even into the present day, to the 21st century. Now, this is written in the 20th century, but it still remains into the 21st century, even 30 years later. Historians have also identified as keys of Southerness, climate, and a historical experience that differs markedly from the general American. The South was warmer than the North and the regions of Europe from which settlers of America came, giving it a different kind of agriculture and crops, cotton, rice, tobacco, sugar, and thus a different kind of economic activity and a different relation to the marketplace than the rest of the United States. When the U.S. Department of Agriculture decided in the 1920s to commission a definitive history of American agriculture, it found that it required two distinct studies to cover the subject. Percy W. Britt Bidwell, History of Agriculture in the Northern United States, and Louis Cecil Gray, History of Agriculture in the Southern United States to 1860. Southerners have, unlike other Americans, more than 350 years of living in a biracial society, 
in which whites and African Americans have reciprocally influenced each other's development. It should never be forgotten that the number of African Americans outside the states of the South was statistically insignificant throughout American history up to World War I. In evidence of a distinctive Southern culture, it should be pointed out that Southern African Americans share with Southern whites nearly every aspect of Southern culture except ethnic origin and political behavior and differ from general American attitudes in the same direction as do white Southerners. So again, I mentioned at the top of this particular podcast that this isn't about white supremacy. There is a cultural distinctiveness that goes into this. You can find these things in the South, but you can also find them in the North. That's something beyond Southernness. It is not a distinctively Southern trait. It's often described that way, but it's not. And I think Professor Wilson does a nice job here explaining there are white Southerners and black Southerners, and they have a Southernness in common from 350 plus years of shared experience. Now, when he was writing this, it was 350 years. It's now 400 years of shared experience. That means there is a Southernness to this. And ultimately, too, when we talk about political ideology and conservative, there were, there were leftist Southerners who were willing to defend the South for decades. They may not have agreed with uh, everything the South was doing as a group politically, but they certainly defended the South. They considered themselves to be Southerners. And examples of this are people like Jimmy Carter, many of the champions of the New Deal. They were distinctively Southern. C. Van Woodward, who Clyde Wilson will talk about in a minute. There are many, many others. Ac Southern academics who consider themselves to be leftists, but they loved being Southern. That's missing because what we've done is distort the Southern tradition to mean these ideologies, which in no way are distinctively Southern. Undoubtedly, the most decisive historical event in firmly establishing a Southern people was the failed War of Independence of 1861 to 65. And like all, all other Americans, Southerners have suffered military defeat and occupation and massive destruction by invading armies on their soil. The Confederate States of America was characterized by mobilization and casualties far beyond that ever experienced by any other Americans at any time in their history. It is estimated that 85% of the eligible male population was mobilized by the War of Independence, and every one of and one of every four Southern white men was dead at the end of the war. In comparison, northern losses were 1 in 10. The loss was simultaneously made up by immigrants. American losses in later years are trivial percentages in comparison. The experience of total war, invasion, conquest, and defeat had effects, both tangible and psychological, that have lasted for generations and that mark Southerners now living. War is the greatest uh, single solidifier of a nationality, and it is hardly credible that Southerners would have fought to such an extremity for independence if they had not been conscious of being a separate people. C. Van Woodward, Pulitzer Prize historian of Yale University in his famous study, The Burden of Southern History, has emphasized this distinct experience as giving Southerners a heritage of defeat and sorrow. Coupled with long-standing guilt and frustration from the difficulty of race relations, the burden of history has made Southerners a sadder, less optimistic, but perhaps wise and more realistic people than other Americans whose history has been one of uninterrupted success. This is a very valid point. And I, what I find fascinating, of course, is that people actually talked about this a lot. I mean, um, Sam Irvin of North Carolina did a little record where he, he it was uh, Senator Sam is the title of the record. And he talked about this. You know, he said that, uh, that that experience of defeat would shake the glory out of the South. People talked about how defeat made the South stronger and made them, as Clyde Wilson says, more realistic in looking at the world. Maybe a little more pessimistic, but certainly more realistic at times. Woodward also points to another consequence of the war. In contrast to America in general, which has been a land of opportunity, progress, and prosperity, Southerners, both white and African American, have a long experience of poverty. The most prosperous region of the United States in 1860, the South, was from 1866 to at least World War II the most impoverished. So before the war, the South was the most prosperous region. After the war, it's the most impoverished. An estimated 60% of the region's capital was destroyed by the war, leaving it economically helpless and subject to exploitation of its resources 
and peoples as a colony of the United States. In 1860, nearly all white Southern families were independent landowners. In 1900, 40% of white Southerners were tenants or sharecroppers. And 60% of African American Southerners were in this position, though in absolute numbers there were more white sharecroppers than black. In the 1930s, President Franklin D. Roosevelt famously referred to the South as the nation's number one economic problem, and public discussions were full of references to the South's colonial economic status. Well, why is that? Of course, the war did this. Now, the modern interpretations of the South deserved it. White Southerners in particular deserved it. Black Southerners not so much, but they were collateral damage. Or not at all, I mean, the current interpretation. They were collateral damage in this. But there was a, I mean, the whole section was destroyed, and it took a long time for it to come back. The South has long been known as a source of cheap labor. As well as African Americans, hundreds of thousands of white Southerners have moved to the North and West in the 20th century as industrial labor. In the North and West, they were treated as and understood themselves to be a distinct ethnic group, referred to negatively as hillbillies and okies. Evidences of this can still be seen, like Little Dixie neighborhoods in Chicago and country music in Bakersfield, California. It is impossible to overestimate the effects of generations of poverty within a prosperous country and forming a distinct Southern identity. Even in currently prosperous and growing areas of the South today, the better jobs are largely occupied by newcomers from other parts of the country and the blue-collar jobs by native Southerners. Southern differences in manners, speech, recreations, religious beliefs, cuisine, and music are commonplace observations in everyday life in the United States. These differences do not have to be absolute. Scots and some Irish and Welsh speak English and are like Englishmen in various ways, but they are still obviously distinct nationalities, as are the French-descended Canadians. Speech, religion, music, manners, and cuisine are the universal markers of an ethnic distinction. The proof of distinctive Southern characteristics in these areas is easily established by the well-known negative and sometimes positive reactions that Southerners receive from other groups. So again, these things that are cultural anchors make the South distinct. Contemporary markers distinguishing Southerners as a distinct group have been given a systematic scientific study in the works of John Shelton Reed, Kenyan professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, especially the Enduring South. Besides differences in lesser matters such as names of children, places, and businesses, Reed demonstrates that public opinion surveys have constant, uh, consistently shown statistically significant differentiation from the American average, especially in three areas. One, Southerners are the most consistent believers in basic Orthodox Christianity as measured by their belief in the Bible, a future state of rewards and punishments, and the reality of evil, as well as in their church attendance. They even outscore Roman Catholics in other parts of the country by, on these factors. Two, Southerners are more local and family-oriented, less interested in distinct events, I'm sorry, distant events and celebrities than Americans in general. And three, Southerners, for better or worse, live by a different definition of a line between private and public. They are more conscious of giving and receiving offense and tend to deal with such things in person rather than call in public authorities. For instance, in the South, murders most commonly occur between persons who are acquainted. In the North, there are more commonly attacks by strangers. Reed has also demonstrated through scientific attitude surveys at Northern and Southern studies that the Students at the Cosmopolitan University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill recognize themselves as having different thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. The distinctive distinctions discovered by Reed are not absolute. There is some overlap, but they are statistically significant, as well as readily confirmed by empirical observation. See the article by Reed from the Encyclopedia of American Ethnic Groups. So John Shelton Reed, a sociologist, did extensive study into this and found that there are Yes, there are differences between northern, Northerners and Southerners based on the way they view the world. And that comes from a cultural background, from cultural distinctiveness. So there is a cultural distinctiveness to the South. Another relevant work is The South and the Sectional Conflict by David Potter of Stanford University, generally recognized as one of the outstanding historians in the United States in the 20th century. Potter affirms the separateness of the Southern people and describes how the, how the difference has, has been created by distinct folk ways, thinking, feeling, behaving, and ways common to members of the same social group and separate political experiences. The hallmarks of a living national culture or its production of arts, both at the folk level, rising spontaneously from the people and at the level of high culture. 
Southerners have produced several original styles of music, and it is hardly to be doubted that Southern writers have produced a distinct and highly regarded by the world literature. The acclaimed novelist George Garrett has demonstrated that distinctive Southerness persists in the most recent generation of outstanding writers. It is interestingly related Southern literary proudness to the distinctive manners of the region. George Garrett's Southern Literature Here and Now and 15 Southerners, Why the South Will Survive. This is from a book that Clyde edited in 1981. Still get it, by the way. It's still in print. The history of a distinctive Southern speech has been examined by the world-famous literary scholar and critic Cleanth Brooks in the language of the American South. Brooks has demonstrated how distinctive Southern speech has contributed to the success of Southern literary efforts. The distinctiveness of Southern accents was part of the lifelong study of the greatest American scholar of English dialects, Raven I. McDavid of the University of Chicago, author of Linguistic Atlas of the Middle and South Atlantic States, and Sociolinguistics and Historical Linguistics. The Southerners can be distinguished by differing voting behavior as a commonplace calculation of poli- politicians and news media and as a subject of much continuing study by political scientists. So again, this flows down, political activity flows downstream from cultural activity. And so the South has a distinct literature, distinct music, distinct language, distinct accents, distinct religion. It is a distinction. It is a distinct people As he said, no matter where you are, you can be in Chicago, you can be in California, but these are people with a distinction that can be measured empirically, not just uh, scientifically, I should say, not just by observation, but scientifically as well. Establishing the reality of, of the Southerner is akin to proving that Iowa grows corn or that Hollywood is located in California. When the term Southern is used, there is not a mind in America that does not immediately reference impressions, favorable or unfavorable, of particular history, literature, music, cuisine, cuisine, manners, and political and religious tendencies. I would like to conclude my expert testimony with a personal statement derived from a speech I made at the annual meeting of the Southern Historical Association in New Orleans in 1995, parts of which were published in the journal Southern Cultures. It refers not to the Civil War, but to the Southern identity today. And this is a, a, about three paragraphs he gave on the Confederate battle flag. He said, the Confederate battle flag is a symbol of Southern heritage and identity. He says, I remember my own father and uncles returning from World War II with stories of how Southerners, particularly rural and working class ones, were denigrated and ridiculed by urbanites for their speech, manners, and attitudes. It was a general cultural attack at the time on hillbillies. This was the beginning of my consciousness of belonging to a separate people from other Americans. It was at this time that we began to display the Confederate battle flag at times from the front porch and to observe Lee's birthday and Confederate Memorial Day. It is relevant, too, that my grandmother was the daughter of a Confederate soldier and had a fund of stories of the family in the war. Our identification with the Confederate battle flag was nearly a decade before Brown v. Board of Education. It had nothing to do with segregation, the Dixiecrat movement in 1948, or football, contrary to what has been stated by several scholars who have claimed to study the matter impartially. My Southern identity has thus been brought to my attention before I entered school, and the battle flag was the obvious symbol of that identity, and a beautiful and hallowed object as well. Time and the success of the Civil Rights Movement and other great changes in the South have done nothing to diminish this, rather to the contrary. The fact that the United States is increasingly a multicultural empire rather than the Federal Republic will make ethnic identities, including the Southern, even sharper in the future, which bodes well to see symbolic struggles among Northerners, Latin Americans, African Americans, and Asians. Southerners, the oldest and largest minority in America, have a right to claim their heritage and its symbols. The South is larger in territory, population, economic strength, and history, and more distinct in culture than many of the separate nations of the earth. He concludes by saying, In recent years, I have spoken often to meetings of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Civil War Roundtables, local historical societies, and other groups. These groups of good citizens are full of defenders and displayers of the battle flag. For most of these good Americans, the flag is not a symbol of white supremacy, but an identification with their own ancestors and heritage and an affirmation of their own identity. So he begins the piece by asking the question, what is a Southerner? And of course, he answers it by saying Southerners are a distinct people based on a culture, not an ideology, not a political ideology, but a culture. Manners, customs, precedents, language, food, 
literature, music, in some cases voting habits, in some cases voting patterns, but you had liberals like C. Van Woodward, who was distinctively a Southerner, who wouldn't have voted with conservative Southerners at all. He was a Southerner because of his culture. and That's the important thing to get out of this. As we explore the Southern tradition, as we explore that in this podcast over the time that it exists, keep this in mind. See you next time on the Essential Southern Podcast.